Uh, okay, so hello, welcome back. Um, <laughs> I know you think you see the glitches that we happen in, and I've had quite a few, but the, the big ones we have to actually redo. So second time trying for unit three. All right, anyway, um, like I said, I, well, this, this unit and unit four, it's always a, a discussion among students about which is harder. Uh, these get pretty complex. But I'm going to remind you again, it's just addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Like, there's nothing here, okay? Like, the, the formulas start getting complex, but we're going to walk right through them. And All right? So, we talked about scores. We talked about the frequency distributions and tables, which is how we collect our data. And then we learned the standard deviation, which is a basis for a lot of our upcoming stuff, right? So, um, now we're going to talk, like I said, we're just going to dive in a little deeper. Things are going to get a little bit more complex, but the math remains the same. Very simple math. So hang on and let's see what we can do. So, you already really know what the raw score is, right? That's whatever score you get, whatever score somebody gave you, you do the one to 10, the one to five, whatever number they pick, that's the raw score, right? <clears throat> so, and it really has no reference point in regards to the means and all those other things we've been talking about. So, right, so what we do is we have what we call a standard score or the Z-score. Z-score actually helps us figure out where somebody is in the group, right? So when you go back to the bell curve, let me see if I can do this, right? I need to. Um, when I go, when I go in, forgive me, right? When I go in the bell curve and I tell you you're here, what does that mean, right? Like, how do I want to know how far above the mean I am? Uh, what my percentile rank is? I can figure all that out right? by doing the, uh, by talking about Z-scores, right? So I'm going to that Thanks. I'm going to go back. All right, so now let me... Uh, so that's how we're going to talk about z-scores. It'll show us where we are, right? So it's a very simple formula. Um, I can't make it too many bigger because, unfortunately. So like I've said before, if you figure out how you're going to be able to read this, I'm, I'm posting it as best I can, but I can't really make it. But I will lose. Yeah, see, it goes off the page. All right. So, we're going to go over here, and I'm going to draw, and I'm going to say, right, so we're going to look. So, like I said, Z. Z equal to, sorry, I got it. X minus M over the standard deviation, okay? So, right, X is whatever score it is, M is the mean, as usual, and S is the standard deviation. So if we have X is 45, and the mean is 34, and the standard deviation is 3.1, then Z, right, is equal to 45 minus 34 divided by 3.1 equal to 11 over 3.1, which is equal to 3.55. Now, we know when we get to the 
through the curve, right, we really talk about scores over three. So three positive 3.55 is like way out here. And you are either an outlier or you are the smartest guy in the class or whatever the case may be. So very high, right? So less than 1% get a number like this. Right? We know that because of the rules that we discussed. Right? All right. So all that is good. Oh, if I can. Um, uh, we just want to do that. All right. So I'm going to go back. All right. So that's it, right? Zero. Real easy. You get your Z-score. Now, one of the deals is, right, if we tell you you got a score of 3.5. If, if I told you your IQ was 3.55, well, how would you feel about that? So we do things to make scores more relevant, to make people feel better, right? So we have what we call transformed standard scores. And in a transformed standard score, we make the mean, we add to the mean, right? So we make a new mean and we decide what it is, right? So your transform standard score is your z-score times this and this new what is standard deviation and the new mean. And we add certain means for certain things. So for an IQ test, we actually make the mean 100, right? I forget what this one was. Anyway, for your t-score. And then like for your SAT score, we make the uh, standard deviation and we multiply it, right? So we make the standard deviation 100 and the new mean is 500. That's why you end up with a SAT score of like 720, 650, right? Rather than 50, okay? So I'm not going to walk you through right? that. That's right there and you can do those things. And like I said, right? So plus three. So three and a half, right, is way out here, the 3.55. And like I said, less than 1% of the people are out here. And that's just the way that one worked out. But we know that 99% of the scores, right, are in between three, minus three and plus three. So 3.55 is rare. All right. All right. So standard scores in the name of care, right, uh, in the normal curve, right, so that we use a table to figure this out. So if I have a z-score is one of one, we know that 34 percent of the cases, right, if we use 68% rule, it's actually 34.13, but we're going to stick with the 30, just talking in third case in, in terms of 34%, are between the mean and standard deviation, right? So that means right here, not this is negative one to one is actually two, right? But here we're talking the one standard deviation, either on this side or that side of the mean. 34% of the cases are in there, right? So, uh, so we don't need to know. So if you fall here, right, say, so what happens if you're 0 0.75 standard deviations from the mean? What does that mean? So we go, what percentage are you? We actually have a table for that, right? And you look at the table and... So what did I say? Uh, we have a, a Z. So this is the negative side, right? So if I go with 3.0, 3 right? Then uh, 3.00 as my three standard deviations even, right? One, uh, one hundred, this isn't even one thousandth, one one thousandth of the scale. So remember I said 3.55? Let's see, we'll go to 3.55, and I said how little it was. Where's five? Yeah, okay. 3.55, right? 99.98% of the people fall below that 3.5 score. See, that's what I said. So it's a little more than 1% above. Right? If I tell you you have a Z-score of... On the negative one, right, 46% of the people, negative, uh, sorry, I tell you you have a Z-score of negative one, right, 
one standard deviation below the mean, then you are going to have 15% of the people, well, basically 15.8% of the people, right? Because you move this over two decimal points, you multiply by 100 to get the percentage. So 15.86% of the people scored below you. So what does that mean? And what if I ask, what is it, how many people scored above you, right? So it's 100% minus the 15.86, right? Which would be 84.14. I know you don't, but like I did that in my head and you can do it in your calculator, right? But that's what I mean. Whatever I'm taking off the left side, right? I know, so I'm going to leave the table. Okay. All right. All right. So whatever I do here, if I say negative two, and, and what did I just say? Negative one is 15.86% is this, right? And this is the 84 point, uh, 84 point once four or whatever it was I said, sorry. Right? Does that make sense? Whatever I said, this whole thing is 100%. So whatever I subtract, the leftover is what's left. So if I ask you what's on the left side or the right side, you should know. And then whatever that percentage is, is also your percentile rank. So I hope that's making sense. And as always, right, please, if it's not, come and ask me some questions, please. All right. So... Let's talk, so the next thing, so that's our Z-scores and how we mark them on the curve and what we do, <laughs> how we're gonna utilize that. So one of the things we're gonna talk about is correlation, right? Correlation, how are two scores related? Right? Because we talk about X and Y all the time, right? On your graphs and all that stuff. One, in, one variable influencing another variable. When one variable having some kind of effect on another variable. So what does that relationship look like, right? Is the extent to which two sets of scores are related. They either have a direct or a positive relationship, correlation. When one score goes up, the other score goes up. They have an inverse or negative correlation, in which case a high score on one relates to a low score on another. Okay? And we're going to keep going on this, so hopefully it'll make sense of it when we do. So, we believe and cause, correlation does not mean causation. Once we're not saying that something causes the other, we're just saying it has an influence on the other, okay? So, a causal relationship means one scores another, but to get a cause and effect requires a very controlled experiment, which is not typically, we're certainly not doing in this class. And, and you know, very rare and very challenging to do at best. So, um, one of the things we do is, right, we represent things with pictures, and uh, we already talked about histograms and all of that. This is a scattergram. So this is a bunch of chords, and I want you to imagine there's a line coming through here, right? an imaginary line that's going up at some angle. Right? When I draw, when I do this, it's like a perfect relationship, but the slope could be like this, and we're going to get into all this more later, right? Or like that. And this is, represents those lines the way I'm drawing them, and these the scores represent a positive or direct relationship, right? When one score goes up, the other score goes up. This scattergram represents a negative or an inverse relationship, whereas, so it's going down from left to right, right? Right, this one goes up from left to right. When it goes down from left to right, it's representing a negative or inverse relationship, okay? Yeah. So to get this, to understand this, we need to do what we call Pearson's R. It describes the relationship between two sets of scores, right? And we're going to get into that, right? So what you need to know is Pearson's R only has a range, and we talked about range, of negative 1 to 1. 
And when you're doing your computation, if you get a score that's like more than more than one or less than negative one, you know you made a mistake. It has to be within this range. Negative one is the positive negative relationship, and one is the perfect positive. Uh, negative one is the perfect negative relationship. One is the perfect positive relationship. So, right, when I went back to these pictures, the perfect positive relationship is a 45-degree line coming from that zero to zero. The perfect negative relationship is a 45-degree line going from the highest score out to the highest score. Okay? See some more of that. And zero means, if you come up with zero, which you will, um, that means these number the scores have no relationship whatsoever. Okay, so R is not a proportion, right? So 0. 0.5 is not half of anything; is no half, right? But what happens is uh, 0. 0.2 0. 0.25 is just as strong a relationship or value as negative 0. 0.25. The relationship strength is the same, right? Or 0. 0.50. And negative 0.50, the relationship between those two is the strength of that relationship is the same. Okay. Uh, all right. And obviously, 0.99 is almost one, so it represents an almost perfect relationship. And negative 0.01 represents an extremely weak relationship. The closer to one or negative one, the stronger is the relationship. Because one is the perfect relationship. Okay, so here's your formula. I guess I'll zoom in for this. And don't. All right, so like I said, it looks very quiet, con looks compromising, it looks uh, challenging, and it can, it is. You need to pay attention to the detail. That's the key. Pay attention to the detail. Now I'm going to walk you through one right now. Okay. This again. All right. So I'm going to walk you through exactly what I did right here. Okay. So we have our table. We got our scores for X and Y. Right. And we want to know what the correlation is between these scores. So this is what I need. This is all the information I need to know. I put this table together. Right. And I just did this. Right. The one as it seems um x squared right 25 oh it's a zero sorry um, x squared right y squared and then x times y just like that and i put this together and then here are all my sums right because we're going to ask for some sums i think anyway here we go right so what did i say i'm going to write this down again i'm going to start right here that's not what I want. I don't have any paste. Interesting. All right. Anyway, so I'll start here. And I'm here. Oh. No. Oh. Me, of course, it's always operator error, right? So R, right, is equal to N. Not there yet. N is the sum of XY. Right. Minus the sum of x times the sum of y
all of which is in the table. All of this is simple math, right? I'm going to multiply and I'm going to subtract. All over the square root of n times the sum of x squared minus the sum of x, right? Which we know is different squared. And we'll show you when I'm putting it together. And then all of this is times n times the sum of y squared minus sum of y squared. Okay? I know, but relax. Okay, so now let me get to my note. Now I'm going to move here because I'm just going to, I'm not going to figure it out again, obviously, right? So now this is equal to um, 6, right? Because n is 6 times 67, which I got from the table, right? I got it from the table right there. No, you're not seeing that, huh? Let me do it. So I got it from the table right here, right? And then I'm just going to keep going. 6 times 67. And I draw it. Back. Oh, no, 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 no. Keep racing. Ah, well, you know, one of those technical glitches, and I guess. Ah. Oh, you know what? Something to do with this magic pen, and I screwed it up. All right. Hey, thank God. All right, so 6 times 67, which I showed you in the thing, right? Minus 19, and I can't go back and forth, I guess, times 31. All of which came from the table, right? The sum of X and the sum of Y. All right. So you have all those numbers, and then you need the square root of... Um, and so it's n, right? We said times the sum of x squared, which is in the table, which is 95, right? minus the sum of x squared, which is 19 squared, okay? Now we're going to multiply this by n, right? Times the sum of y squared, which is 207, minus y, the sum of y squared, which is 31 squared, okay? So simple, right? So 6 times 67 is 402, minus 580, 19 times 31 is 508, 589. We're going to have to erase this again now. Five 
589. Right, all over the square root of, um, let's see, where was that? 570 minus 361 times. 1,242, right, which is 6 times 207 minus 31 squared, which is 961, okay? So, this is all equal to negative 187, right? I subtract the 402 from 589 from 402. It's a negative number all over the square root of... 5,000, okay, which is equal to negative 187 over, oops. Negative 187 sorry, over 242. The square root of this is 242, and you got this with your calculator, 0. 0.341, which is equal to negative 0. 0.772, which we we're going to say is equal to point, negative 0.77. Right, two decimal places. And that's it. So, you know, R is equal to, and I'll go back here, R is equal to negative 0.77. All of that, all right, just adding, multiplying, subtracting, nothing special here. Okay, I don't know where I am. Um, uh, sorry, there I am. I don't know if that helped or not. I don't think you need to see me there and all that. Anyway, okay, there we are, right? The other thing you need to know and keep in mind is the degrees of freedom for Pearson R is N minus 2. So in this case, the degree of freedom I want to move you. I guess I got to go back here. In this case, the degree of freedom, right, is equal to n minus 2. In this case, is 4. And that's going to come in handy because in a minute we're going to show you why. Okay? So, that is Pearson R, right? Looks scared. I mean, looks complex. It is complex. Don't get me wrong. Pay attention to the details. The thing that I see most students doing is dropping this square root sign before they're supposed to, and then they come out with a crazy number, right? But you'll see here, I know I'm in the ballpark because I'm less than uh, between negative one and one. And so I know my answer is, uh, is close, if not right, correct, okay? All right. All right, oh no. Okay. Now, so that's Pearson's R, and that's how I did that. Okay. Now, the next thing we do, the next thing we're going to do is get it to, no. The next thing I'm going to do is talk about the coefficient of determination, which is, I thought I fixed that one. Um, and hang on, I thought I fixed this last night in the note. Let me make a note to fix it, okay? Because that should just all be the same. And it should just say, it should all be, I did fix it. Why isn't it there? Anyway, those should all be lowercase r's, okay? Uh, sorry, 
And really, it's R squared, and I'll, I'll fix the notes. And I did fix my notes. I don't know why the old ones are still posted with the mistake. Anyway, sorry about that. But we're going to talk about R squared, right? And so the coefficient of determination gives us what percentage of the change in one is controlled by the is in relationship to the change of the other. So we know we have a relationship. In this case, we know we had a negative relationship because it's um, the answer is negative 0.77. So we know, right? So in that case, we're going to be looking at a line, right? That goes this way. And as this score goes up, this score goes down. Or as this score goes up, right? Okay. So as one score goes up, the other goes down. So we'd be looking at a line like that, as I described in the scattergrams, okay? So now we're going to talk about what percentage of that change is influenced by the other variable, right? Because there's other things that influence everything too, right? That's why we say we're not in a controlled experiment that allows us to um, you say that it, this 100% control, right? So we're talking about what percentage. So this is what we do, and that is how we get that. R. Uh, coefficient of determination is R squared. So in our case, right, which is R times R, in this case it's negative 0.77 times negative 0.77. Right? Now I should be more consistent. I don't even I can't use X, right? So we know that. Huh? See? So we're gonna get rid of that, right? So how do we do it in our world? Really, right? Is I by parentheses, right? So I know if I'm doing this, I know to multiply, right? And so that turns out to be, in our case, 0.59. And now to get the percentage, right, we need to multiply 0 0.59 times 100, right? You get a percentage, and in this case, that's 50. All right, so basically 59%, so almost 60% of one variable is as it influences almost 60% of the change in one variable is related to the other variable. Not 100%, 60%. And that goes along with how strong the relationship is too, right? Because this is a fairly strong relationship, right? So it would make sense that it's over 50%. So this is uh, not quite perfect, of course, right? And so this would not be 100. If it turned out that R was 1, then this would end up being 100. I'm very close to it. Okay, so... Um, so that's nice, and we, um, you know, we work on that a lot, right? But obviously, a lot of times we have more than one variable, more than two variables, and we want to know how the two variables will affect the third variable, right? And so we talk about multiple correlations, and you'll see that right here. And I know you can't see it because it's too small, but and I hope you figured out how to get them on your screen or print them out or whatever it is you're doing to work with this, right? So, but it's the best I can do. All right. So, uh, so how well do two variables predict the third, the criterion variable, the variable being predicted, the criterion variable? So I have one variable to be predicted. In this case, I'm going to talk about your college GPA. We believe we can predict that from your high school GPA, right? Predictor, a predictor is via, uh, variable two is your high school GPA. And then the other predictor is variable three, we're going to call is your SAT scores, right? So this is what we do. R, right? We're going to talk about R1 and R2, and I don't want to get it. I don't want to go back and lose my spot here. Uh, 
stuff. It's not a birth control. Need Anna. <laughs> anyway. Um, so it's R1, right? I'm going to go R1, 2, which is how R, the, the correlation between variable 1 and variable 2, right? Then we have a correlation between variable 1 and variable 3, right? And then we have a, a variable the correlation between variable two and three, the extent the two predictors are really correlated, right? Correlated. So the relationship between all of those are described as that, right? So there we have, so I'm going to give you these values. R12 is equal to this. The correlation for R12 for uh, variables one and two is 0.55. The correlations for variables one and three is 0.44 and the variable. Correlation for variables 2 and 3 is 0.38. And this is where we get into this, right? So I have to take this away, take myself away. And we'll move on to a blank one. Right? And now we're talking about R with a capital. Let me see. Capital R, that's why I need to fix that other one. Right, is the for multiple correlations. Right. I'll forgive my spelling and my writing, right? I've asked you to do that before. Okay. So we're gonna go. And this is R is equal to, I guess. R is equal to the square root of R12 squared plus R23 squared, one three squared, sorry, I can't even read my whole thing, minus 2 times R12 times R13 times R23. Okay, I know. All right, once again, it looks complex, but this is just multiplication, right? This is nothing. Okay, and all of that is over 1 minus R23 squared. All right, so we have all these numbers. I gave you the numbers, right? So there's no problem. And just in the exams, you're going to get it. You don't have to figure it. You know, you'll get some R. You know, obviously, you'll have to compute some Pearson's R in the exams, and you'll have to, you know, answer questions. But I give you values that you need. Don't worry about it. So R12 is 0.55 squared, right? And this is in the notes. You're going to, you know, you'll see my notes. Right, and then plus uh, 0.44 squared, right, minus 2 times 0.55 times 0.44 times 0.38, right, over 1 mi minus 0.38 squared, right? Okay, so... All right, so all of this then is equal to this, right? So as I said, square this, there's nothing to it, right? So I have 0 0.30 plus 0.19. Because when you square decimals, they get smaller, right? Minus all of this turns out to be 0.18. I'm going to just let you know, okay? And all of this is over 1 minus 0.14, which is equal to the square root of 0.31 over 0.86, which is equal to the square root of 0.36 
which is equal to, I hope I gave myself the answer, <laughs> which is equal to uh, 0.60. <laughs> All right, there you go. Uh, sorry, you can't see it here. You, yeah, you're not looking at that anyway, but it's in there. All of that is in here. It's in the notes, just like that. Okay, a little bit neater. Anyway. Uh, that's that right so that's how I did that right and once again a lot of complexity a lot of uh, you know looks like a mess but you just like pay attention follow the thing follow through pay attention to the details and you'll be fine okay all breaks down the simple math all right now here is another table right and so we don't always have to do all this i am going to try to click oh well the other way to get here is i posted all these tables to inside the modules the link doesn't work so good here and then but in the modules right is the pearson r significant table so my degree of freedom, remember I said before, it's n minus 2. So in our case, it was 6. So this is 4. So here's what happens. Now I have this number, right? Or I have my negative 0.77, whatever the case may be, right? But either way, I have my degree of freedom. So this is what we call, these are what we call the critical values, right? I want to go back, and, and this is actually in relation to the negative 0.77, our Pearson's R. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, let's see, maybe I feel like that. Nope. All right, so keep in mind, this is has to do with our Pearson's R, the negative 0.77 that we computed. These are what we call the critical values. We're coming to, we're going to start talking a lot about statistical significance. If my research has statistical significance, and the way we figure that out is using these tables. Somebody's figured it out for us already, so thankfully. We typically look at this column, the 0.05 uh, value, because that means 95 times out of 100, I only, I'll be right. I have a 95% chance of being wrong and only a 5% chance of, of, I mean, I have a 95 chance of being correct and only a 5% or less chance of being incorrect. So that way, when I say this number, like X is gonna be equivalent to this Y, and I use that prediction, I have a 95% confidence level that I will be correct. Okay. So, like I said, you need the degrees of freedom. You go down here to six. You go over to the column, right? Obviously, the critical value is 8.1112, depending on how you round it off. Ours was negative 0.77, so we're nowhere near the mark. Right, so we do not have any statistical significance and we can't claim statistical significance. So for whatever reason, our data is invalid, right? So I'm just gonna go back to my notes. <laughs> so that's how you use that table. And once again, as always, if there's questions, please come and ask, all right? I know this is a lot, and like I said before, this is a big section, and the next one is our big section, and once we get to those two, we'll be much better. All right, so I think this is the last thing we're going to talk about. Well, I put the table in there, but obviously the link takes you to the table too. Okay, that link works. All right. Uh, the last two topics for this uh, chapter is linear regression. So remember, we talked about the scattergrams and how, um, sorry, making you dizzy. We talked about the scattergrams and how there's that imaginary line through there. And so this is how we compute the angle of that line 
and how we use that line, right? So uh, this is what it's going to look like. And I'll explain all this after we get through all of this. Okay. <laughs> so linear regression, we're going to make predictions based on the known variables. So Y is the score to be predicted or the variable Y. Intercept is the point where the where the line starts on the y-axis, and you're going to see this, okay? So, right in this case, I said it's 2, and that's where we start, our line starts, okay, right? Then we have the slope, and then we talk about the angle of the line. What is the angle between here and straight? What is this little angle like? And that's what we figure out is what we call the slope, right? Uh, you might find this odd, right? But like in, in construction, we use, use this a lot for how do we build a roof? What kind of slope do we need for a roof? Do we need one that lets rain fall off? Or do we need one that gets snow to fall off? What do we do? Okay. Um, X, of course, is the, scare, the variable X, whatever the score is that we started with, right? So we need to know what Y is, right? And y is very simple. It's a plus b times x. And a is simple. It is the mean of y minus b times the mean of x, right? So what's our problem here? The biggest problem is, oh, why don't I have what a is? Um, our biggest problem is b. We don't know what b is for this. And that's where we're going to come over here. And so this is B, uh, and B is a little, uh, like I said, B is one, again, one of the complex problems, but it's not, it's again, just simple math. So hang on, and we're going to walk through this too, okay? So give me a second. I know you've given me a lot of seconds here, but... I'm going to go through and um, show you that this is all done here. I'm not going to be able to show you. I'm going to do this on the thing for you, right? Okay, so I don't have the, I'm not going to be able to bring over the table. So let me see. I'm not going to bring over the table and I don't. Oh, there we go. So now, I'm sorry, I've been screwing this up right now. I can do it over here. All right. All right. Let's see, it's not working that way. All right. So anyway, keep your eye on the table, and then I'm going to go here, right? So like I said, B is equal to, I mean, a fraction. So it's the sum of XY, right, which we get from the table. Y, not a nine, <laughs> minus right, the sum of X times the sum of Y all over N, right? So now that's why this is in brackets, right? Because only this piece is over N, not the whole thing, okay? And then this is the sum of x squared, right, minus, and again, it's the sum of x squared, the sum of x squared, right, over n. And again, right, we're only going to divide this by n, not the entire thing. That's what the brackets are for. All right, so this becomes 67 minus 1931 right which is all from the table over six and then all of this is over 95 minus 19 squared over six right which is equal to 67 minus 89 over 6. 
over 95 and this 361 over 6 and I can can get rid of the brackets at this point on this and I did left them up there which is 67 minus 98.16 all over 95 minus 60.17 which is equal to negative 31.16 over 34.83 which is equal to negative negative point eight nine four which for us is equal to negative point eight okay so the negative relationship, we kind of knew that because we're using the same table, I'm pretty sure. All right? We're using the same table, the same data as we did, right, where we did our Pearson R. So uh, we knew it was a negative relationship, and now we know that um, this is so this should be negative, so all of that aligns, okay? Uh, so now what are we going to do, right? So like I said, now we're going to... Now we have B, right? So I'm going to say, I'm going to move into another tile. And then over here, I'm going to write B to negative 0.89, right? OK, so what I have is, right, I want to know A. And so in this case, it is, right, the mean of Y minus B times the mean of X, right? And so I didn't write the mean in the table, but I'm going to tell you that the mean of Y is 5.17, and you're going to figure this out on your own. You can actually add a thing to the bottom of the table if you to put your mean in if you can figure you want to figure those out, but you will, All right? So I have times B, and mine is negative, right? 0.89 times the mean of x, which in this case is 3.17. So this is equal to 5.7 minus negative 2.82, right? So right, if you subtract the negative, you're actually right. Subtract the negative, you're actually adding. So this becomes 7.99. For our purposes, we're just going to say it's 8. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, normally, you would use it 7.99. I'm just going to round up to 8.0 for this case. Okay, so now I have that, right? So I have, so now what do I need to know, right? I need to know what Y is. Y is equal to so what is Y? So Y as I know is equal to A right plus BX, which is in this case is equal to A is equal to 8.00 plus B, which we know is negative 0.89. Times x, which in our case I'm going to say is what did I say it was going to be? What did I say? Ten. In this case, I'm going to say x is ten. So I'll put this just to make it simple, right? So now we have eight, you know, o plus negative eight point nine o is equal to negative 0.9. All right. So if I have a score of x, that means I have a y of negative 0.09. Negative 0.9. Okay. So then what do we do? So then we can graph all this. So I'm going to go back up. I need to go this way. 
All right, so in this case, I did some different computations. I said X is 11, B is 0.5, and so here we go. Uh, so when you do your line, right, so this is a positive relationship, and B is 0.5. So what that means is as I move over to the right one unit, I'm going to go up a half a unit. In this case, we decided a unit was 6, right? So I came across 6, and I go up half of that, which is 3, and that should make sense, right? Because this is close to 5. This should be 5. And one, two, three, right? Two, three, four, five, right? So that's it. I went up from two to five, which is three, as I went across six. Hope that's making sense, right? So I went over this way, and then I go up half a ways, right? In our relationship, right, everything we've been talking about, and I guess I should have drawn this out, maybe I'll edit in this case, right? So if I have a score of and like I would have to change these numbers because I would need to be a, have a score is less than zero. Um, so I will figure this out. But in this case, I want to show you I did A is this, B is this, and X is 11. So then Y, if I did it this way, if X is 11, I say Y is 7.5. And if you come out here to 11 and you go up, a little off, but if you look across, it should be right, right about 7.5. Right, and that's how I made the line, tells me. And so by plotting these points, right, I should be able to draw this line or draw this line and verse the plot points that land on the line. And that's linear regression, okay? I know, it's a lot, and I know I gave you a lot today. We're going to go over one more thing real quick, and then we will be done. And you can watch this video in sections, and obviously you can take breaks. You have all, you know, you have access to it all the time. So the last thing we're going to talk about today is the null hypothesis. And once again, I, I, I talked about, let me get rid of it. I talked about. Um, you know, how the curve is theoretical, right? And so we're working on a lot of theoretical models and the null hypothesis is the theoretical model that says, if we study a population, whatever we define that population to be, we, we define what the population is. But if we study the entire population, there's no difference between the means, right? So, if I'm studying all the kids at, at John F. Kennedy Elementary School, and I say, and I take all their reading scores, if my thesis is that girls read better than boys, the null hypothesis says if I get the scores of every kid in that school, there'll be no difference between the average for the boys and the average for the girls, and they are the same. We in research, right, are always trying to disprove that or prove it, but mostly we're trying to disprove that. Right? So, uh, because we believe there's differences, we believe that things are right. And so, but this is the null hypothesis, and I'm going to expand this a little so you can see without getting too far off, right? So, sampling it. So when the null hypothesis says that any difference between those means is due to sampling errors, right? Because we've sampled. And even if we do the whole the thing, so right, because we can't necessarily get every score for every kid in the school. One was sick when they took the test. Like there's a bunch of things that we have no control over. So we took a sample, right? And we take the girls in the sixth grade and the girls in, and the boys in the sixth grade. And we try to generalize that to the entire population. But what the null hypothesis says is that there's a difference between those two means in the sixth grade boys and girls, it's because the sample is the problem, not the population. All right, so the true difference between the means is zero. And this is how mathematically we represent that. I'm not doing any math anymore, okay? So don't worry. Um, and this goes back to what I called about statistical significance, and I'll tie that in in a second. So, the null hypothesis, HO, 
that states that the mean of population one or group one it, it minus the mean of group two is zero because they're the same, right? Uh, there is no true difference between the mean and any observed difference is due to sampling errors. I just explained all that, right? And then your hypothesis of your study is what we call an alternative hypothesis. So we have a directional hypothesis where we're going to say girls read better than boys and girls are group one. And so the mean of group one is greater than, and I'll fix that, it's greater than um, the mean of group two. And I'll get rid of that line under there, make it read right, where it just says the mean is greater than group two. Group two. So the girls are just better than boys. And this is what we call a directional hypothesis. We're saying one is bigger than another, greater than another, however you want to say it. A non-directional hypothesis, we're just saying we don't know if it's going to be a greater or lesser, but we're going to say we're still saying there's a difference. So we're just saying that the mean of population one of sample one does not equal sample two or group two. Then this is what we talked about. Remember, I talked about the table. I said the probability is less than five out of a hundred. So P is less than 0.05. And for the null hypothesis, this is how we base. So we talk about statistical significance. If we have statistical significance from the tables, then we will reject the null hypothesis. And it's not true. If we do not, then we do fail to reject the null hypothesis. And we're saying that we could not disprove, right? So. Uh, so this is it. Like I said, the 0.05 level is the level that we typically look for when you see in research articles and all that. That's what you're normally going to see. The 0.01 level, of course, is obviously one time in 100, which is even greater confidence. And then there's the 0.001 level, which is one time out of 1,000. But, uh, you know, it's rare to even reach that. So most research is based at the 0.05 level for uh, statistical significance. That's what I said here. So we have two things. We have a type one error where we reject the whole of the null hypothesis when it turns out to be true, or the type two error where we fail to reject the null hypothesis when it turns out to be not true. Okay. Then to reject the null hypothesis, we need to have statistical significance. Okay. And we talked about that. Um, so at 0.06, there is no statistical significance and we reject the null hypothesis. At 0.05, we, we do not reject. And at 0.05, we do reject. And this is what I said about 0.01. I know that's a lot today. Take it in bite-sized chunks, take it over and over, take a good look at it. It's getting very complex, but it's also a very simple. So I hope this helps. And if not, like I said, please reach out to me quickly, reach out to me soon and help you with further explanations, more examples, whatever it'll take. Okay, so good luck. And uh, we'll look, see you in Unit 4.